looking back to last week, I was talking about how the uh, Advent season leading up to Christmas can present some challenges for those of us who no longer believe in the uh, theology um, that is based on what I like to call the three S's, which are Satan, sin, and salvation. And so many of our traditional carols and hymns contain those elements, and it's impossible I mean, we've tried, but it's impossible to rewrite all of them in a way that still works. So what I prefer to do when I can't change the lyrics is to focus on the big picture. And I ask myself, what do these songs have to say about the way that humankind thought about the world that they lived in? What do these songs have to say about their dreams, their hopes for the future? You know, one of the most common themes, one of the most common hopes and dreams that we started talking about last week is this idea that maybe, just maybe people might learn to get along. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, as it says in the book of Isaiah. Peace on earth, one of the most enduring themes of Christmas. And it endures because we just can't seem to make it happen. It needs to endure unfortunately. Peace on Earth, the enduring pipe dream, which uh, actually goes back to another passage that we find in Isaiah, which talks about what's supposed to happen when this great Messiah leader arrives on the scene. Here's what it says. He shall judge between the nations and arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war no more. We won't study war no more, which is the way I think it's uh, put in a popular spiritual. That's a theme that gets picked up once again in the nativity story in Luke. The shepherds, they're out watching their, their fields at night, those wandering shepherds. And uh, there's this choir of angels filling the sky, and they're singing glory to God in the highest, peace, peace. To all people on earth. Peace on earth. So this seems like the one time of year, among all the other times of year, this is the one time of year where it seems as if we dare to believe that such a thing might be possible. It's in the songs we sing, it's in the cards we send, the stories we tell, it's all over the place. And when we look at the earth from a certain perspective, it looks as if indeed peace on earth is a reality. How about this perspective? Now when you see it like that, it's hard to believe that at this very moment there are places on that, on that planet involved in armed conflict and violence right now, but from way out in space you can't tell where one country leaves off and another begins. You can't see skin color, you can't see religion, you can't see nationalism, maybe except for the rivers and coastlines and things like that, there are no boundaries or divisions. When we see things from this perspective, we wonder, what is there to fight over? Back in 1990, NASA sent a spacecraft called Voyager 1. It was heading out to the edge of our solar system in 1990, and Carl Sagan was one of the consultants on the project, and he had this brilliant idea. He asked the people who were controlling Voyager to turn it around so that it would face the Earth and be able to photograph Earth as it got farther and farther away. And then it finally took a picture from three billion miles away. Now, now this next one up here, this one was taken at quite a bit closer than three billion miles while it was still heading out. But I'm gonna let Carl Sagan tell you some of his thoughts about this picture and the one that's coming next. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they can become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. 
how frequent their misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our costumes, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. And that's where that clip ends. Well... was supposed to go on a bit longer than that. <laughs> Where he talks about how looking at it from this next perspective here, there it is, that's the pale blue dot, and it really is a tiny teeny blue dot from three billion miles away. Um, it tells us that um, we've got some work to do and that uh, we have a responsibility maybe to deal more kindly with one another. That's the message he's trying to send here. And I think we're making some progress. I think it's slowly happening. I think the message here is that we're not a lost cause. We've made progress. In fact, last spring we looked at some of the numbers while we were working with that book called Enlightenment Now, which makes a great case for human progress, that maybe we're starting to learn our lessons. Um, this graph here, this next one coming up, shows us that uh, battle deaths have declined. They've plummeted since 1945, World War II, all the way down to where you see it there in 2015, which is the last year where they get some statistics. That is some real progress. So I think Christmas, this Advent season, can be an annual reminder of where we need to maintain our focus. It helps to remember that um, there is good reason for hope because of something very real that happened on a battlefield during World War I. Now for those of us who have heard this story before, this is our annual reminder. And for those who may not have heard this story, it's a powerful testament to the existence of something in our human DNA that wants to be done with war. In 1914, in the winter of 1914, there was a spontaneous undeclared Christmas truce. This was during World War I. It happened on a battlefield in northern France known as Flanders. The Germans had been in this fierce, protracted battle with the British and the French. Both sides were sleeping in these deep, wet, muddy, man-made trenches that literally went on for miles. Imagine what that must have been like. And on the night of Christmas Eve, German troops began to put small Christmas trees lit with candles outside of their trenches over on their side. Now, from what I understand, the German troops weren't all that far from home, so they were able to get packages that were sent from home. That's how they got the trees and the candles. And then they began to sing... Christmas songs. In German, the British and French soldiers didn't exactly understand the words, but the melodies were familiar, so they started singing those same songs, but in their own language. So, sights, sounds, maybe even the smell of the candles started changing, started transforming consciousness. The idea of a, of a truce started to take hold. Now, both sides were communicating as best they could this idea that, uh, you know, maybe we ought to take a break for Christmas. Since we're all singing Christmas songs, maybe let's stop this stuff for a while. And by daybreak, 
No man's land between the trenches was filled with troops from both sides, and they were sharing whatever they had, cake, cognac, tobacco, postcards, things like that. In a few places, they even made makeshift soccer balls, which they kicked around, at least that's according to some of the accounts. This was a truce that lasted up until about New Year's Day, and of course at that point the generals, who weren't out there on the front lines or in the trenches, but the generals back home, safe and warm, ordered the troops to start shooting again under penalty of court-martial. Now, according to one historian, many of the men who took part in the Christmas truce refused to fire on their opponents again until the day they were rotated out and other soldiers came to take their place. At that time and that place, Christmas changed people. Memories of better times were triggered, and we know how powerful our thoughts can be. For a short while, they did it. There was peace on earth in that very unlikely place, the middle of a battlefield. Maybe it was easier for this sort of thing to happen in a place where the opposing sides had a had common religious traditions. Maybe that was part of it. Different languages, but the melodies were the same. The holiday traditions were, were similar. And maybe what happened was that they simply chose to focus on what it was that they had in common instead of what it was that artificially divided them. So World War I goes on for another four years after that. There never was another Christmas truce. Maybe it's true what they say that Peace is harder to make than war, but it sure is worth the effort. And if Christmas spirit can bring a world war to a screeching halt, maybe we need to bottle that stuff. Now, someone with a Scrooge attitude might look at this story and say, oh, well, it was all just a lot of feel-good nostalgia that caused the truce, and there was no permanent change. To them, I say, so what? So what if it was feel-good nostalgia? And how can we say there was no permanent change? We keep telling the story, don't we? That's about as permanent as it gets when it becomes a part of our history. The story keeps coming back because it's a message of hope. It's this great example. It's kind of like the other Christmas stories we listen to each year. And even a temporary shift in consciousness is something to celebrate. So Christmas tells us that it's okay to be optimistic. It reminds us that people can change. And all it takes is a few people to do it, to embrace that kind of transformation. In fact, it's absolutely amazing what difference just one person, one transformed consciousness can make as it ripples out into what we saw in that story. So the message of Christmas is that human beings are capable of being better than world events would lead us to believe. Why would we speak of peace on earth unless we thought such a thing was at least theoretically possible. And once we think that, then we can start visioning what would that look like? What would we like it to look like today? So the Christmas truce of 1914 was a good start. The numbers since then show that violence is decreasing. And that's some positive news for both motivation and celebration this season. So, peace on earth, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a super solstice to all. <laughs> See you next week.